Well, there's lots of differences, but I'd say the first one is someone who is financially rich is an owner. They're not a consumer. They're a consumer also. But when somebody is poor, they're a consumer. That all they do is they take the, you know, I always tell people we're all financial traders. My people say, I'm not a financial trader. Yes, you are. You're trading time for money. Yeah. That's the worst trade you can ever make in your life. Um, somebody who's wealthy has made money their slave. They're no longer the slave to money. And the way they do that is they figured out how to become an owner. And the way you do that in the most simplistic way, I, I even taught it in my first book, was you have to decide there's a percentage of money that you're going to keep forever. You're not going to give it to Kate Spade or Ferrari or anybody else. You can do that too. But there's a percentage of that income that never will be touched, that you will grow and compound and will provide income the rest of your life so you don't have to work. Now, when I was growing up, Everybody's goal was get rich enough so you never have to work. Now, like all my friends are 15, 8, your teen years, my senior. People like uh, Steve Wynn in built most of Las Vegas. He's like 74. Uh, Warren Buffett's 85. Uh, Peter Gruber, one of my dearest friends in the world, owns the Golden State Warriors, the LA Dodgers. We're partners in the LAFC football team in LA. Um, brilliant guy, 74 years old. And they're all working harder now than they ever were, and they don't have to work. So the goal is. Make enough money so you don't have to work and then you'll do what you love and you'll pour your time and energy into it. But you have to make that decision. It's the first most important decision is I'm going to become an owner of American business. You don't want to have an Apple phone and not own Apple. And you don't want to just own Apple because any company can go up and down. Right. Right? You want to own the index. You want to own you know, a variety with enough diversification. But if you can just shift, and I've taught people who've told me they couldn't, they have no money, they can't save. It's really easy once you get momentum. There's yeah. a research project I did with um, a gentleman uh, who was nominated for Nobel Prize on behavioral finance. And what he did was he said, if you can even, you know, you need to save 15% ideally. But if you could even save 3%, because anybody can do that. They right. took a group of blue collar workers in the Midwest and said, we're gonna force you to save 3%. I think it was three and a quarter or three and a half. But then we're, everybody can die, go on a diet tomorrow. Everybody can mm -hmm. save money tomorrow, right? Yeah. So his tool was, all right, you're not gonna to save today, you're gonna to save tomorrow. We'll do the three and a half percent, but then you go to your employer and say, the next time I get a raise, the first 5% goes to my savings account, to my investing account. And then every time you get a raise, you do that. Well, in 14 years, the average person was saving 15% and the top 40% were saving 20. Mm. Well, let me explain what that means. You and I were together before. I, I, when I'm trying to explain compounding to people, everybody understands it intellectually. But when I ask some of the richest people in the world, what are most investors failing to do? And they all say they're not tapping the power of compounding. So if you're in a situation where, as an example, let's take um, your, you've got $100,000 that you've saved, you're 35 years old, and you put it in the market and just leave it there and never add anything to it. If you leave it in the market and you're only being charged 1% in fees, at retirement 35 years later, you got 762,000 from that 100. Never added a dime, it grew that much. Wow. But if you pay 3% in fees, which is the average most people are paying, when you ask people where they're paying, they don't know or they say 1%. Because when you hear about it, fees, let's say a mutual fund fee, you'll always yeah. hear 1%. That's the expense ratio. Mm -hmm. There are 17 other fees. Yeah. So every 1% you overpay, you know, 1% is the average. But uh -huh. If you pay 2 or 3 and the average mutual fund is 3.12, sounds like nothing, 1 or 2%. But every 1% you overpay because of compounding right. means you lose a decade of income. So the person who paid 1% has 762,000, the person who paid 3% has 452,000 dollars and they own the same stocks. It's just fees. So while we compound our interest, we also compound fees. So if you could save 3% and build it to 5, 10, 50, or you start with 10 or 15 and eventually get to 20, before you get in the game, know the rules. Be the insider. Because when a person with money meets a person with experience, we all know what happens. Mm. <laughs> Phraseman said, person with experience ends up with your money. <laughs> so what I want to do is save you that. And I give you nine myths, nine lies that you're going to make sure never happen to you again. They're all marketed. And one of those myths to give you an idea is fees don't matter or it's only 1%. That's what everybody says. Right. And I go through and show you systematically what it means. If you pay 1%, a real 1%, which almost nobody does, versus 2 versus 3, you're buying, you can have three people, they start at the same age, they put in the same amount of money, they invest in the same stocks, same bonds, same mutual funds, and 30 years later, they show up and one's got 77% more money. You know, they start out with a million bucks, you know, they got seven million, the other guy's got four. If it's $100,000, 700,000 versus four. The amount of money difference of those fees, and if I said to you, Brendan, here's the deal, I want, I want you to make an investment with me, here's how it's gonna work. I want you to give me your money, you're gonna put up all the money, you're gonna take all the risks, 
If it loses money, if it loses everything, you lose everything. Right. There's no consequence here. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you, you put up all the money, take all the risk, you take all the losses. But if you make money, uh, and even if you don't make money, I get paid. Right. And uh, I get, over the course of your lifetime of investing, 30, 40 years, I'm going to take 60%. Would you make that deal? Nobody would. Uh, but they don't know that they are all day long. You that's know right. It, that is what you do with the average mutual fund today. Because yeah. the average mutual fund with Forbes is 3.1%. If you're in a 401k, instead of saving money, many times when you add all the other fees, according to Forbes, it's 4.1%. What that does to your yeah. ability to ever get financially free is it basically decimates it. And how is that possible? Jack Bogle, the head of Vanguard, taught me this. He said, Tony, watch. Because people don't know. They, they don't do the math. For every 1% you give away, over the course of your lifetime, that's approximately 20% of your total take. So if there's 3% in fees, you gave up 60%. Mm. You took the risks, you were on the line, they took no risks, and they're gonna take 60% over the lifetime of what you're doing. He said, it's highway robbery. That's why you can go invest in those same stocks with Vanguard on an index, and you pay 14 basis points, which that's another term. By the way, every time I use a term in the book, I explain like basis points. What the hell is a basis points? It's 0.14%. Right. If someone says 25 basis points, it means a quarter of a percent. Right. So every, if I say an index fund, you know what it is? I explain what it is in the book. So that you someone's gonna people, knows, get, it. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. get it along the way, and I give them examples so they see what it is. So what you do is you become an insider. Mm -hmm. because, because what happens is every type of powerful institution or organization or field has its own language because that's how they keep power. So if you go to your lawyer, there's a lot of things you and I could easily do ourselves, but we don't know the right legalese. So the words that you could say in English, they say in legalese, and we can't do it, so we gotta pay them for it, you know? Now, a good lawyer's a good lawyer, but sometimes there are things you could do. You know, uh, some of the company, online companies are charging $20, what some lawyers used to charge 2,000 for. Right. The capacity to strengthen and increase your hunger is the one common denominator amongst the most successful people. You know, um, you know Richard Branson's a good friend of mine, and. Peter Goober, Steve Wynn, all these guys, they've never lost their hunger. Most people are hungry to achieve a certain amount, make a certain amount of money, and then they get comfortable and relax, or to get a certain level of fitness, and then they relax. But, you know, Richard is as driven today as when he was 16 years really? old starting. I mean, he's like on fire, and he's 65 years old. Warren Buffett is 85 years old. He's as driven today huh. as when, you know, he began the journey, right? And so people that have that hunger, I believe intelligence I love people that are wickedly smart. Yeah. And I work to be wickedly smart by educating and training myself and so forth and training my brain. But intelligent, there's a lot of intelligent people can't fight their way out of a paper bag, yeah. right? Absolutely. Hunger is the ultimate driver. Because if you're hungry, you can get the strategy, you can get the answer. If you can't model it, you can find it. The Freedom Fund is this idea nobody wants to save, right? And millennials right now are doing the worst job of it in a long time. And it's not because they don't care, they're irresponsible. It's frankly, they don't trust the market. You know, they saw what happened in 2008. They don't know where to really to go. And so they're being stimulated like crazy and they're spending like crazy. But if you really want to have freedom, then what you have to do is you've got to take that percentage aside like Theodore Johnson did. And you've got to just say, this is for me. This is my freedom. There's a part of what I earn, as basic as it is, we all know this from investing, there's a part of what I earn that is mine and my family's to keep and no one's going to touch it and I'm going to grow it. And But I also believe that where you put that really matters. And so indexing is the most basic way to do it for sure. But what all these investors showed me is asset allocation is where the difference is in business, right, in life. If you look at it, the fourth key we talk about in the four steps is you got to really understand asset allocation. Because uh, when I was with David Swenson, David said, Tony, I said, what are the dials you can move? I mean, there's a limited number of dials you can move to increase your returns, to get to your financial freedom faster. He said, Tony, there's really only three. He said, you can make a better choice selection of the actual investments or the securities. You can have better timing or you can have better asset allocation. He said, let me give you a clue. The first two will never happen. He said, because they cost money if you get them from somebody else. And everybody's wrong on timing. Everybody's wrong on the stocks. This is where all your money is made as asset allocation.